word floating knee actually was first introduced by McBride and Blake in 1975 for ipsilateral fractures of the femur and tibia, where the knee is completely uh, disconnect, disconnected from the rest of the body. And uh, if you see, they are usually a result of high energy trauma, which uh, Dawal was just saying, uh, most of these injuries are actually high energy trauma. This was the classification which is usually used by Fraser. Uh, it has been done by Fraser. Type one is the diaphyseal fractures of the ipsilateral femur and tibia. So you have it in the diaphysis mostly. And the type two are, is a combination of diaphyseal and uh, intraarticular uh, injuries, or it can be both intraarticular injuries. So type 2A diaphyseal fracture of the femur and intraarticular fracture of the proximal tibia. Type 2B are intraarticular fracture of distal femur and uh, diaphyseal fracture of the tibia. And type 2C are the combined intraarticular fractures of distal femur and proximal tibia. So uh, in this, the type 1 is the most common one. And uh, I was just showing what we should look for in these patients because th these are high energy trauma. So you always look for any associated injury. And there is about 50 to 70% incidence of open fractures. And it's mostly tibial fractures, which is, has a higher frequency of being open. And the injury to knee ligaments is also commonly found. So one has to keep it in mind. If you can see it clinically fine, if, you, if it's, it's suspected, then you should get an MRI done to see whether there is any uh, ligamentous injury. And also there are high chances because it's a high velocity trauma, again, chances of neurovascular injury. And also look for whether severe head injury, chest injury, and other associated fractures are common in these patients. So there is a treatment algorithm which was uh, given by Bertrand et al. Like uh, the patient with a stable, uh, the patient with a floating knee is in a stable condition. Then if it is a close fracture, then you can think about a definitive fixation. But if it is an open fracture, then we have to think about again an external fixation or depending on the type of the grade, you can go ahead with a definitive fixation with primary debridement. That depends on your uh, you know, choice of how you want to do that. Now, if the patient is in unstable condition, then again, uh, like even in bilateral femur practice, which you've done, uh, which have seen that we do a damage control DCO. So do an external fixation. Then uh, there are if there are clinical indications of any ligamentous injury, then do an MRI and then later on go in for definitive fixation. Now, what type of definitive fixation uh, can be done? In just diaphyseal fractures, if there are MRI or clinical signs of any ligament isolation is not there, then we can, one can go with a single incision, retrograde femoral nailing and anterograde tibial nailing. If uh, in the diaphyseal fracture, there are signs of uh, or MRI the, uh, suggestive of ligament lesion, then you should think about an arthroscopy. You have to keep it in mind. So it is better to do an anterograde femoral nailing and anterograde tibial nailing and do a ligamentous reconstruction after recovery from the bone lesions. And in, in the other, if there is an epiphyseal fracture, then again, you will obviously have to do an open reduction and internal fixation. Epiphyseal means, uh, what I mean is that if there is an intraarticular injury, then you know, obviously your main consideration is your articular or, you know, reconstruction. So there has to be open reduction, anatomical reduction, and internal fixation. So let's uh, just, I'll show a case which uh, there are definitely a few cases, but this one I'll just, this is 24 years old male involved in a RTA, again, high energy trauma. There's a fracture shaft to lower one third of the femur with a butterfly fragment. There's also a segmental tibial uh, uh, shaft fracture. Patient also had a transverse fracture of the patella, which is not seen in this uh, uh, x-ray, unfortunately, but this patient also had a patella fracture. This patient was hemodynamically stable, and this is a type 1 injury, 
but also as i said this uh, type of high velocity trauma you should also look for other associated injuries and this patient also had a tcf acetabular fracture so that also we had to keep in mind because uh, again depending on the or what are the fractures or injuries are there you have to take in consideration to, for, for your uh, positioning of the patient while operating so that's what we look for at all. so in pre operative planning we thought about a single incision so retrograde femoral nailing in this patient and anterograde tibia nailing and because there is a transverse fracture of the patella we thought about tons uh, tension band wearing now we can think who oh, which one to do first as you say uh, the retrograde femoral nailing because that there are high chances of injury to other soft tissues so it is better to take care of the femoral fracture first we do a retrograde femoral nailing first and then an anterograde tibial nailing and at the end tension band wearing of the patella this is the same single incision we can do it in a supine position and so once you have done that we either you can do in the same sitting the fixation of your acetabular fracture because this was a t shaped fracture we could do it in kl approach for this uh, fracture which had shown so again the position uh, position had to be changed into semi prone position and fixation accordingly so this was the post stop x ray i will not uh, this is a very poor x ray just a long time ago and you can see we have not touched the peripheral fragment we just left it just like that because this was a close nailing which had done even the tbl nail we had used an unrim nail in this and we had done the acetabular fracture with the kl approach and this is the post op x ray this is six weeks post op as you can see there is already starting of some callus formation there looks in good position there this three months post op the fracture is united well even uh, the peripheral fragment it was quite displaced but but we haven't touched that and it is still going uniting very well and this is three months post op for the acetabular fracture also which is healed well and this is one year post op all the fractures united very well so uh, to take home message is this floating knee injuries are usually a result of high energy trauma so always follow the atls pro pro protocol because they can have associated injuries which will definitely take precedence to look after so always look for associated injuries which will play a significant role in surgical decision making and this type 1 injuries can be effectively treated with a single incision retrograde femoral nailing and anterograde tibial nailing when the others i've already discussed are the what type of, of approach you can do depending on the type of fracture we are dealing thank you